Good afternoon, everybody. Time to get started. Um, today, I'd like to in introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Minot, who is a uh, distinguished and a regents professor in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. Uh, she's also the executive director of the Institute for People and Technology. And um, where she really focuses on the role of ubiquitous computing sensors, um, ubiquitous displays in the role of health, and I think that's gonna be the topic of her talk today. Um, she's also an ACM fellow, a member of the Sig Chi Academy, a research fellow for the Sloan and Kavli Foundations. Um, and Beth has really been integral, I think, to the foundation of our uh, discipline of, of human-computer uh, interaction and human-centered computing. Um, she certainly um, has taught many, many people in that space over the years. I was one of them. I was in the inaugural class of the Human Center Computing Program, PhD program at Georgia Tech. Um, and it was there where I got exposed to uh, sort of the foundational literature in the field. I learned about Holland and Hutchins and Norman and Kirsch and all these great uh, researchers in the field you know, all, most of those I mentioned here are uh, right here at UC San Diego. So, um, so I thank you, Beth, for exposing me to the field and also to the possibility of UCSD as a really cool place for this work. Um, and with that. Perfect. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thanks to Jim and for everyone who has hosted me so well. Um, people keep saying the weather is cold. Uh, you are clearly not calibrated well anymore, um, but I've had a delightful visit. I've been up for about 14 hours, so I'm not actually quite sure what's gonna come out of my mouth anymore, um, but um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you today. This is, um, this is a new talk, so, um, and in particular, part of what I wanted to do, this is really aimed at the students in the room, um, because I'm gonna talk about really the, the I'm gonna say the potential, but we're gonna talk about the pitfalls, and this is a retrospective of the lessons that I've learned uh, coming into this with all of the good intentions and great research questions, but nevertheless, uh, kind of the surprise discoveries along the way as we've attempted to blend these fields of HCI, ubiquitous computing, now everything is about AI, uh, to address challenges within healthcare. So to understand my background and my framing, uh, so the first is that um, I became a ubiquitous computing researcher when I joined Xerox PARC um, after graduating with my PhD in 1995, work with Mark Weiser and team, and came out of that three years later um, back at Georgia Tech, founding my group called Everyday Computing to understand the transformation of everyday life um, as computing became more pervasive in everyday activities. And what I remind my students is this was before cell phones, uh, this was before you ubiquitous Wi-Fi, this was certainly before Raspberry Pis and all the fun gadgets and things that we work with today. You know, I got to work with the, the first tab, the first PDAs. My laptop when I was in graduate school was an $18,000 Sparkbook, uh, which then I probably dropped on a plane. Um, so it was a different world, and the types of mechanisms that we began to leverage at the time were you know, questions of what type of sensing could we have in the environment, what was natural interaction. We talked a lot about what context awareness meant and what it could be. And when I joined Georgia Tech, I joined this gang of researchers uh, in the creation of the Aware Home. Um, and so that is a laboratory and working with folks like Gregory About and others to, to portray kind of this pivotal point of where we were within ubiquitous computing. And there was lots of enthusiasm about the types of things that we wanted to do. And now I'm looking at this 20 years later to see what I've learned. And the reason I think this is important is first off, uh, there are you know younger, newer folks coming into this fold. So let's learn from some of the mistakes and some of the assumptions along the way. But this is also a very important time in our national and international conversation about our expectations and the agendas that we should set as researchers. So where we end today is going to be the question of what should we be doing as a field going forward because it, you know, the punchline is, by the way, that health in my mind is now personal, social, and negotiated 
which makes it much more complex to go after some of these lofty goals that we had at the very beginning, but that doesn't make those goals any less important. Um, it just makes it means that we need a more nuanced and a more designerly approach, uh, which is why I think it's appropriate for this venue uh, to, to go forward. So I'm gonna talk about a whole host of projects. My apologies that I'm gonna go through them quickly and give you the highlights, um, but there is a narrative arc across all of this. So what I have found in my work has been a combination of what I learned in school, <coughs> what I learned on the job, and then what I had to kind of learn in real time as I was going after this. So this has been kind of my world, is I started out in the UB Comp world, and I can take this talk and then put AI there and everyone's just as happy, but uh, the, the UB Comp world, and then I came out of this with a you know, well-trained within HCI design. So those were the pieces that I started with. And then as I moved into the sp space of health and healthcare, I had to learn a whole bunch of things that weren't necessarily taught in any of my classes and not necessarily part of our field, but understanding the relationship of how people's behavior was shaped by the affordances and the capabilities of these technologies. And then um, I had to pair that with, well, what kind of outcomes was I actually after uh, in our research partnerships? And then all of these things got folded together in the type of design interventions that I wanted to create. So the kinds of things you'll hear me talking about today is, you know, how do we have kind of awareness for caregivers, for example, in healthcare? How do we help people with, I won't call it decision making, because most people don't think of themselves as decision makers, but they will think of themselves as solving problems, being a detective. How do we encourage behavior change, such as fitness? And overall, how do we then create uh, scenarios where increasing patient engagement and improving patient-centered care? And so you will notice as I walk through these projects in chronological order, that my proximity to the healthcare industry gets closer. So I started this as kind of a, a uh, in the wild computer scientist trying to do good things where physicians wouldn't even really talk to us um, and kind of inched my way closer with all the benefits and disadvantages of, of that. So within the space, this was my first project and um, I learned so much from this. So uh, the Aware Home was about five minutes old. Uh, we had decided for good reason that uh, focusing on individuals that look like ourselves uh, was terribly uninteresting for the future of home technologies. And then myself working with Wendy Rogers, who is an expert in cognitive aging and psychology and others, had focused on the challenge of aging in place. Um, we did this back in 1998. Uh, it's still a grand challenge out there today. Um, but the question was, what, kind of, what could we do in technologies in the home to support independent Independence and quality of life of older adults. And we had all sorts of great medical oriented ideas, supporting memory, avoiding accidents, uh, some of the things that you hear about. But following my, uh, what would become HCC training, my HCI training at the time, you know, part of what I learned in all of this was to find really good informants, really good folks on the inside who would expose the real problems and the real kind of design opportunities within this space. So in this case, um, we landed up talking to uh, clergy, to chaplains, who counseled families on uh, the potential move of moving a parent into an institutional care setting. So we wanted someone who was kind of a witness to that type of decision making so we could hear what the real questions were, what the real challenges were. And what we got out of this was this question of, of peace of mind, because what we heard from that chaplain and then what we heard from the families that we talked to was variations of the question, well, my mom or my dad was almost always a mom. My mom lives by herself. My father's passed away. I live end states away. I can't be there. I need to know that she's okay. Um, and you know she's been recently sick or recently fell or recently something you know wouldn't it maybe be better if she was in an institutional care setting for you know for my peace of mind and so we referred to this as a peace of mind gap um, and focused refocused completely on our questions of caregiver awareness and how could we build that and so the, our technologies at the time were rudimentary, um, but what we landed up looking at was the question of, well, what could we sense in the home that could provide for this peace of mind gap? And in particular, what would be the kind of the appropriate privacy preserving techniques within that? Now, I will tell you that my computationally oriented colleagues had some really bad ideas. 
Um, so, for example, one of the bad ideas was uh, a focus of like, okay, well, you could have a picture of her, and if she's having a bad day, like the picture could fade to gray. <laughs> I'm like, have you met Southern women? Right? Um, like, when would this ever, ever be a good idea? Um, and then we would talk to uh, the the families that we were working with in kind of our qualitative field work, and um, we would get kind of questions as like, okay, so there's sensors in the home. Um, will my son know when? my boyfriend comes over. I'm like, hadn't anticipated that question. No, but thanks for asking, right? So it was very it was a very delicate space, but we landed up with a solution that looked at an approach that looked at motion sensing with the home and could we get an overall gestalt of how active the person had been at the home and then there was another level of visualization to this that gave more detailed data. But the broad gist of this was we had 28 days worth of data and the size of the butterfly indicated how active the person had been in the home. One of the things that we ran into and continue to run to in all of this work is if the question is, is this person having a bad day? Very difficult to answer from generic sensing. And the reason from that is, let's say, if we're looking at motion data, well, they haven't moved around very much in the home. Well, it's a rainy day. They had a busy day the day before. You know, that's kind of where their mood is. Or if it's a high energy day, well, that doesn't necessarily actually mean it's a good day because wandering is actually one of the things that we look at now uh, with folks with, with dementia. So we settled on kind of how, uh, how is this person, how much activity is there in the home and fit that within the social relationship. And I think that was the big aha for us. So as we started to work through this design process and started talking to more families, then we got to the next stage of this, which was the, the re based on individual social relationships. So we would talk to uh, prospective older adults and they'd say, well, I like this idea. Um, you know, can, you know, it'd be great if my daughter-in-law could have this or my son can have this, but not that daughter-in-law because I don't like her. <laughs> or uh, not this person, but my nephew, that would be terrific. Um, and so what we started to hear was kind of in the context of these relationships, this is where this technology would make sense. And then what we heard from others was that kind of within that, then there were certain kinds of activities or patterns that they would look out for. Um, and so the indication, like a deviation from like the Monday morning routine or doing something different on a Saturday afternoon, that would be sufficient knowledge for a family member to say, okay, something is awry and something isn't. The funny thing is, is that now my mom is very much aware that I can look at her Fitbit data and almost get kind of the same level of information today. Um, I know that she volunteers in the hospitals on Fridays and her footsteps go up on Fridays and I know what Sundays look like. And if I look at her data, which she has allowed me to set up, I can kind of glean the same amount of thing. So we, we finally went into the field with this. And um, so a few other, few other stories uh, from this particular project. Um, so the, um, the first is we were uh, interviewing a, a son who had the connection to his older mother through our system. And he uh, had talked about there was a setting where he had come home and he had looked and the butterfly was as, as large as it could be. It was, it was an outlier. It was something more than it should be. And so he called up his mom. And um, I can tell you what he didn't say. What he didn't say was, hey, mom, remember that system I have monitoring you? Well, it says that you're up to something, so what gives? Because she would have unplugged it and that would have been the end. What he did say, as a as appropriate uh, a southern son would say, it was like, hey, mom, how are you doing? And she was like, oh, thanks for, you know, I'm having a great day. I finally got around to painting that hallway. You know, I've been wanting to do this for months. I finally got around to it. I've got everything down. I've put up the primer. I'll be able to finish it tomorrow. So what she had done was ping between two of the sensors over and over again all day, making the data skew. And he's like, oh, that's really fantastic. I'm doing well here. Thanks. All right. That was how it worked. When we interviewed her at the end of the study, um, we had an even bigger surprise. So during the course of the study, I had realized that we had discovered the healthiest 80-year-old woman in my entire knowledge, right? The longer we worked with her, you know, she volunteered, she was out in the garden, she had no noticeable health problems. As far as I was concerned, she didn't need us, and she must really be um, uh, annoyed with our presence in her life. Um, and was putting up with this because her son was a Georgia Tech alum and had volunteered to do this. 
And so we talked to her and, she, and we showed her visualizations like, oh yeah, that makes sense. This is what I do here are my routines. And we said, you know, is there anything else you want to tell us about the system? She said, no, I've really liked it. It makes me less lonely. And we stopped. And you have to remember, she had no display, right? There was no visualization for her. That was all on her son's side. All she had was a computer that she would occasionally very nicely reboot for us, uh, sitting in her hallway closet, where we were pulling in the information and um, uh, you know, working across the modem. Yes, it was that long ago. Um, and so we said, less lonely. Can you tell us why? And she says, well, you know, there's days that I don't get out of the house. I don't really see anyone. And I just know that I had this special con connection to Bob, her son. And I know that connection is there, and I feel less lonely. And that was when like, all the little spider sense of researchers you know, goes up. And it's like, oh, we're onto something, but we're onto something that we didn't know that we were after. Because this question that we had been driven by, which was, was today a normal day? Computationally, all of my machine learning friends in the audience keep working on that, because that's a very hard question to answer. But what we learned was designing something that had just enough affordances, just enough capabilities, that's how I always describe it, um, just enough capabilities to be embedded within that social relationship, they made it work. And it answered his concerns about peace of mind awareness, and it provided a benefit to her that we did not even realize we were creating. So from that aha that this is much more social and much more detailed, uh, we then um, naively still went ahead with our next study. You can time date this by the Nokia smartphones. Um, so we were getting tiny bit closer to health conditions. So we were still focused on aging adults. And, fo and everyone said, OK, well, that's great, Beth, that you're working on this. But there are diseases that are common uh, in the aging population. Can't you do something about this? So we landed up focusing on, on technologies for diabetes management. Um, and the prevailing medical wisdom at the time was that folks just needed to know more. They needed to understand. Um, pointing to the brain, right? They needed ment you know, cognitively to understand how to adjust their diet so that they could be in compliance. Um, and in this case, we took as our informant and partner in all of this, a diabetes educator and nutritionist. And what she, uh, her, her vocation was that folks had been newly diagnosed with diabetes would come and take classes with her. Um, and they would learn kind of the inside and out of diabetes and blood sugar management and uh, different types of lifestyle choices. And um, then they would proceed on. And what we were able to show in her work and our subsequent uh, control study was that folks were really good at, at learning book knowledge about diabetes. You know, pre-test to post-test uh, was, you know, vastly different. And their behavior didn't budge an inch. All right, so that's where we started. But what she told us was that, and um, this was like the, the peace of mind awareness question, she says they need to learn to be detectives because diabetes acts differently in each person's body once you take into account sleep and stress and diet and uh, everything else that's going on in their lives. They need to understand how diabetes works for them so that they can actually make the changes that will, will matter. So we set out about creating a detective tool. Um, and the detective tool was pretty simple. It was a Nokia smartphone. And it basically said, any time in your day-to-day -day life when diabetes rears its head, when you have to stop what you're doing to think about the fact, OK, I've got diabetes, what should I do? Grab that, you know, grab that moment. People took pictures. People left voice messages. People. Uh, wasn't called texting back then, but they kind of captured text. And it all went up into this not terribly pretty, but nevertheless secure website. And then the diabetes educator could look into this and then have a very simple chat, uh, asynchronous chat with them um, about what they were doing. So what did we see within this site? What we didn't see was folks kind of like trying to do everything the doctor said. We knew that they tended to discard that pretty quickly. But they would focus in on one thing. And it was seeing these little cycles of mastery, as we called them, that became one of the major ahas. Uh, what they would do is say, they'd be like, OK, um, um, I'm struggling with 
what I should eat for breakfast. So I'm going to experiment with that for a little while. And uh, one person was really determined, like, could I keep drinking orange juice in the morning? That was their thing. And they wanted to work on that, and then they wanted to grab the numbers and work with the educator on that. Um, another person was really frustrated. You could see it on the site. It's like, I woke up in this morning, and my sugar levels are nuts, and all I've done is sleep. You know, and it was pretty much a what the hell kind of kind of question. And the educator would say, you know, we talked about in class having a snack before bed to kind of keep regulating the sugars. Person's like, okay, I forgot that. And then the next day they'd be like, what the hell? You know, numbers are horrible. And then the educator would write back, well, what was your snack? Candy bar. Okay, maybe we should, you know, have a snack that's a little uh, not in that in that territory. And then they would work that and then they would declare victory and then move on to the next thing. When we talked to the diabetes educator, we were a little worried because there was all this stuff going on. It's like, okay, what, is, what has this been like for you? Like, what is has the impact on your workflow? And she says, no, it's amazing. It is a night and day difference because when I talk to them in class, I get generic questions and we have generic advice and it never seems to go anywhere. But now I actually see the pictures of the food and I get this and I, it's inside their context and I can give them targeted advice. And we were able to see in the uh, website, they were actually starting to make those changes and to do that experimentation. Um, and what we were able to tell, at least from the initial data that we were able to grab in this study, is that um, it, their, their notion of, in this case we were looking at self-efficacy and locus of control, their notion about whether they could be empowered to make a difference in their life was starting to shift. And in the control group, we actually saw it went in the negative direction. The more medical knowledge they had about diabetes, the less in control they felt about, about their lives. The fun part was when we talked to uh, the, the, our diabetics, so our, our users in this particular case, and so we asked them, um, so kind of another classic qualitative methods question, like how would you describe the system to another person, right? You're gonna teach someone how to use this. Because it was, you know, it was a smartphone and cameras and asynchronous and you know, encrypted data and, and all of this. And they looked at us like we were stupid and said, well no, I was just talking to Hannah, the name of the diet. The technology completely disappeared. Right, from their perspective, it was based on their trusted relationship with this person, the fact that they were able to go through kind of the context of these lessons and dig into that. And for them, the technology wasn't the point and it didn't make a difference. It was about that trusted relationship. Now, I would love to say that we've been able to continue this work. We went from an NSF grant and then tried to get NIH funding to continue with this and NIH insisted that we take the human out of the loop. Uh, they insisted that the goal of this was to remove the person and automate the advice giving. I would like to say that approach works as well. It doesn't. Um, so proceed far. So our, our technology is getting a little more modern. I'm now up to fitness trackers and I'm now working in pediatrics. And uh, in this case, it was another one of those, you know, we know what they should do, we just can't get their behavior to change. But in this case, now we're working with adolescent kids. And the goal by the Humana Corporation, and they're based in Kentucky, hence all the things about horses, because it's all about horses. Um, their, their goal was to have uh, uh, kids who were overweight, who were fighting uh, adolescent obesity, to be more active, right? So this was one of the many, many variants of competitions with, with fitness trackers. Um, and so they came up with this thing called the Horsepower Challenge, um, and it was a school-by-school school competition, so uh, the different middle schools would get sent this beautiful, exciting box of fitness trackers, and they were supposed to be given to the kids, and the kids would compete, and which school won, we'd get some cool gym equipment or something like that. Um, and we were brought in as third-party evaluators, so we didn't design this, we just got to evaluate it. And it was quite the train wreck. Um, that doesn't fit with the horse metaphor. So, uh, so the first thing, so first thing that happened, well first off, some of the schools were like, okay, it's a competition, we want the gym equipment. So they gave the fitness trackers to the cross-country team. Okay, well, okay, we'll take them out of, the, out of the picture, right? So kind of completely defeated the entire purpose. Um, but what was more interesting was when we saw kind of the schools that had actually been successful and the schools that had failed, and it went 100%, and many of you will not be surprised by this, but Humana was, dependent on the social context of the school itself. 
right? So there were the teachers that made it part of the classroom ritual to kind of recognize the folks with the steps. There were the teachers that came early and opened up the gym so that folks could get their steps in. We thought, naive person that I was, I didn't have children yet, I learned, um, that the kids would be more active on the weekends, that's when they would go get their steps in? Nope. If they had steps, it happened during the day, it happened during the school hours, and it happened because of the social context that those teachers created. The kids that were successful in this, it was because of that context. If, it, if they did not have a uh, good context, and really, really overweight teachers was a, really, was a very clear example of that, just did not even did not even budget. But nevertheless, there were a lot of problems inherent in the competition, so we got some funding to do it a little bit more our way. Um, and this was a fairly, I would say, fairly successful project. So we went back into the school systems and developed uh, a system called StepStream. Um, and I think there were some really important ahas to this. So we built it into the social context, so we kind of worked with schools who were willing to partner with us, who were willing to pull together a cohort of kids, but the cohort of kids was selected for the kids that needed the intervention. So we weren't working with a cross-country team, um, but unfortunately in the schools we were working with, uh, finding kids who were relatively overweight for their age was not, uh, well, not too difficult uh, to glean that population. They were given uh, pedometers to count their steps, but what are the things that we learned to do right? So we actually took some of our clues from uh, folks who have looked at behavior change in the energy context and built it based on observational learning. Um, and what, what that meant was if we were looking at social comparison theory, and if you had a leaderboard with a competition, well, who are the kids that are motivated to keep up with that? The ones at the top of the leaderboard. Who are the kids that we need to reach? The ones down here. So we took the head-to-head -head competition factor out of it, and the only thing that the kid could see is where they fit in the pack, but they, no one else could see that information. And so what we triggered with that was that response of, well, I can do a little bit better than that. And so what we saw in our study data was that we actually the behavior change that was the greatest was the kids at the bottom of the pack because they wanted to be just a little bit higher. So that worked. The other thing that we did, which is now called AI, um, was that we had a social agent in the stream. So when the kids posted their data, as we know, it's really hard for me to post my data and to count on that Jim or Steven or Lily is gonna say, yay, Beth, you did good. But it was really easy to write a little agent that said, yay, Beth, way to go. And it was more likely that you would then pile on later and say, yay, and I would get something from you. So we had just enough intelligence, not really, just enough automation within that for the social reinforcement for the kids to pile on earlier, uh, kids to pile on later and to kind of build on that. The best thing that we saw in the interview data from this at the end was we had a standard survey that was essentially kind of like how health-oriented, fitness-oriented are you? And it's really good in, in middle schools of discerning the people who think of themselves as athletes and everyone who doesn't. By the end of the study, we had moved the needle on the self-report around did those kids think of themselves as health and fitness oriented? They had moved enough, they had changed their behavior enough, and they had been reinforced socially enough uh, to go forward for it to make a difference. All right, so I'm gonna speed through a couple of these and try to bring this all back together. Um, so we're getting a little bit closer to physicians. So I've now moved from nutritionists to, to fitness coaches, and so now I'm actually working with real life doctors. Um, and in this case, we're working with doctors who are trying to diagnose and particularly trying to treat kids with pediatric epilepsy. It's a very hard problem. Um, they're, uh, like our diabetics, there's a multitude of factors that go into uh, epilepsy management. Um, it can be sleep, it can be diet, it can be stress. Um, and uh, on top of that, you're dealing with uh, adolescents who are also excited about talking about their health with their parents. Um, how many parents do I have in the room? Yeah, it not, not, doesn't happen very well. Um, you have a long time of changing treatment or changing a drug regimen to be able to see its effect. It's not immediate. Um, and then, you know, associated with those delays and understanding the impact of treatment changes, you know, they're not counting being in the ER. Um, 
they are uh, only in the doctor's office like every six months, right? So this is a situation that is dying for some form of awareness of the context that these kids are in to be able to move forward with this. So what we did was we did a number of things. Uh, we did some work on improving seizure, seizure detections. Most seizures are not the grand mal seizures, but they're actually kind of the quiet uh, seizures. So being able to get to that data and do that more reliably. Um, being able to do that better in sleep studies, but the most important part was looking at mobile and wearable tech uh, for, for reporting. So the gist of this, and um, many people who have done work in UbiComp will recognize this scenario. Uh, could we recognize, uh, so we wanted to nag people to fill in the diary data so we could have better uh, symptom management, so we could uh, better improve treatment. So how do we improve nagging? Um, well, you want to remind people at times that they might be likely to do it. And so we took the scenario of when the parent and child seem to be co-located in the home together, that this would be the time to raise kind of an awareness that was basically, it's like, okay, you know, you and your dad need to sit down and fill this out. What we were also trying to do was to get uh, redundant information because if we could get the parent and child to both self-report, then we had two data points and that was the ground truth that we wanted to go after. All right, so what worked and what didn't work? Um, the co-located nagging worked a little bit, um, but uh, it failed in two really important areas. So the first is, is that uh, parents and kids, and now I understand this, are really good at triaging labor, and it'd be like, okay, you did it, I don't have to do it. So trying to get the redundant reporting failed immensely, because um, they, from their point of view, it's like, well, okay, trying to explain that science needs double reporting was not going to work. Um, so we would get one data point, we wouldn't get two at any time that we got it. Um, what was interesting, and we should have known this from the diabetes work, was trying to get people to pay attention to everything doesn't work. Um, and so the physicians would have their kind of theories of what mattered. And the parents and kids would have their own pet theories as to what they mattered. And those were the things they were paying attention to. So the aha that we got from this at the end was the most important thing we could do was to get those on uh, the same page and say, we're really going to focus on sleep. Oh, we're really going to focus on nutrition. And we're going to work our cycle of mastery around that and see if it makes a difference as opposed to broad reporting about everything. This is important because I will get into this later because if we're trying to develop machine learning and AI-based systems for physician decision making, we have to recognize that they have spotty data. You have population data as a whole, but what you're trying to do is take that individual piece of data and then match it against that. We need to develop systems that recognize that, well, parents and kids aren't going to provide redundant data, and more likely, just like our diabetics, they're going to focus in on areas, and they need at least be focusing in on the same areas. So very much like the, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the gut system we were talking about at lunch. Gut instinct. Yeah, very much like that. This We were talking about this as, as one of the projects here over lunch. Being able to kind of hone in that experimentation and developing a system for that was really key and important. Okay, last project, and then I'm going to reflect on this in some ways. Um, so uh, this project is still ongoing. We're finishing our, our data collection. Um, but it's provided a really interesting opportunity of, again, looking at a different type of AI challenge. So remember I had my little simple social reinforcement agent, and then we were trying to do some slightly better things in the epilepsy uh, uh, data uh, management. In this case, we were given the opportunity uh, to look at how we can increase patient engagement during breast cancer treatment. So that was kind of the, the writ large statement. Um, for those of you, how many people have worked on patient portals? Horribly designed little critters, right? So we were, that was, we first had ONC uh, funding to like get people to engage with their patient portal. Um, still haven't managed to get people to do that because as a whole, the information provided on the patient portal is neither very actionable or interesting for most patients, at least in Georgia, maybe it's better out here. Um, but what we were able to continue working with was this question of how could we coach or assist breast cancer patients uh, throughout their treatment journey. 
Um, so in this case, we had another informant. Sorry, I missed one of my informants, but this one's a, a particularly great set. So we worked with a group called Cancer Navigators. I don't know if, if navigation is a, is a term that folks are familiar with here. Um, they're a very special set of folks within the healthcare system, and they are, they are what they say. They are to help patients navigate the healthcare system. Um, some of them have expertise that's clinical, so they may come out of nursing training. Some of them have expertise that's more in the social services. But their job, and they're, they're kind of heroes within this, is for whatever you're dealing with to help you get through treatment successfully. And the folks that we worked with, that could be everything from um, answering, helping people like kind of make sense of treatment decisions or understanding what's going to happen in terms of side effects. It can also be getting gas cards so they can get to treatment or assistance with dealing with bills. Um, it's kind of everything within, within that space. Um, so what we learned from the navigators was there's a whole host of, of questions and challenges that patients face during treatment. And the first and foremost thing that they, they explained to us, and we heard this loud and clear from the patients once we were asking the right question, was that we had to treat this holistically. Um, it would not work if we created an app that was only about chemo and radiation. What we had to do was recognize what the cancer journey was for them, and it was also about nutrition and gas cards and talking to friends and family, and what does it mean when your friends only can ask you about cancer, and how do you manage with your children, or you've got an aging, all sorts of questions. But if we met them where they were with respect to those questions and designed for that, then they were willing to be engaged um, and work with this. So the design of the system called MyPath, and I'm now up to Maya Jacobs' work, is a, uh, we've been handing out tablet computers. There's a whole set of lessons on why that's a challenge. Um, but we've been handing out tablet computers with this app. And it is essentially the uh, repository of the American Cancer Society and cancer.net. All of this information that previously was handed to them in this big old binder of paper, literally, um, all this information available to them. But then we tag it. Um, using very lightweight AI based on where they are in their treatment path and the information they're providing to us essentially around patient reported outcomes uh, with a survey that's available to them. So what have we learned about this? Well, first off, the holistic approach really mattered. It matters in a number of different ways. First off, it matters because we're treating them as people, not patients. Um, and we hear that over and over again in the interviews and the work that we do. The fact that we are engaging them on the set of questions that they may have um, allows them to negotiate what they want to care about and when. And we've been hearing all sorts of things like, um, uh, you know, I'm a cancer patient, so I want to change my diet. Okay, that makes sense. I'm a cancer patient, and I'm really struggling with how to deal with family and friends. That's okay. I'm a cancer patient, and I've decided to go back to college. Didn't expect to hear that one, but our system can help you with that too, right? Because it's like, okay, I have a new look on life and this is what, these are the goals that I'm setting for me and I need this system to recognize that in terms of where I am. Uh, we also saw this in a holistic way because when we set up the tablet, we did not lock it down. And this was a fun fight with the physicians. So uh, some of the physicians were along the lines of, okay, they're gonna use the tablet and they're gonna go on the internet and they're gonna read weird stuff about cancer treatment. And I, we tried to gently say, they're doing that anyway, um, but if we keep this open, then they'll use the tablet for other things, which means when they need to look up cancer information, it will be charged, they'll remember their password and they'll have it with them. And our log data has, has uh, shown that in spades. What we see is the, they'll be using kind of the health resources on the tablet and we'll see you know, little peaks of activity and then that'll go quiet for a little while. And then they'll be using the Bible application they downloaded or the, the games that they play during chemo um, or what other application that they installed and then they will go back to it. Um, I am pretty darn sure if we had locked it down and it wasn't useful during those times, they would have lost it, they would have forgotten it, they wouldn't have charged it, and it wouldn't have been there when they needed it. So holistic really mattered. The personalization, um, again, is very lightweight. So it is, uh, first off, based on where and when they are in their treatment. So you're coming in for surgery. Okay, here are the resources associated with surgery. You're coming in for chemo. You're on day two of chemo. Here is the information about common side effects. Um, and what we heard in that was um, 
uh, you get you get the quotes that you love, right? It's just like it knows me, right? Um, that that personalization kept them coming back to the resources and compared to our previous system that didn't have personalization, we'd see a burst of use and then it would peter on out. In this case, they kept coming back to it. Um, the adaptive bit was was that um, as they told the system more about the things they cared about, then it would further personalize to them and further react to them on that. Um, and what we heard from that was um, we continued to get a pace of regular use. Um, and there's a whole bunch to unpack about the design process of this, but uh, our successful users, and this is the majority of them, 80 plus percent, would fill out the survey on a regular basis. They set a routine for that. Um, they would get new resources associated with that, and then they would come back later, and you could see during the week they would kind of peek at or work with those resources. They'd fill out the survey again, most of them did it weekly, and then they would keep doing that. And what we're able to see is that they're, the things that they are using are shifting, as you would imagine, throughout their treatment journey, to the point that when they reach survivorship, and we can see them, they're looking at things about hormone therapy or other aspects of survivorship. So we can see that path within that. But th to be able to see that heartbeat in the system and be able to have that continued use and that continued patient reported outcomes is a big win uh, within this space. So where did it break? Um, the most interesting part where it broke um, was uh, we were dealing with breast cancer knowledge. That was our knowledge base. Uh, the folks who quit using it, when we interviewed them about it, they would say, well, um, I have diabetes. Should have known that from my other work. I have diabetes, and my oncologist is telling me one thing, and my kidney doctor is telling me something else, and the system's not telling me what's right. Right? And so their, and their expectations of the personalization were now quite high, um, and we couldn't, we couldn't fulfill that. Um, the problem is, is that there's, you know, Watson and everything else can't fulfill that either, right? They're, you know, this is an open challenge for us, which is when they're grappling with these comorbidities, so we saw dementia, we saw diabetes, kidney disease, and so on, that to be able to respond and engage on that is a really hard knowledge management question. So that was an open, open space for us. Um, there's some other things that are not f failures, but they, are, they nag me. Um, so uh, first off, they trusted the system and quite high, and we have ratings on that, because we delivered it through their healthcare system. So just like our diabetes manager and our other projects, when we deployed these things through a trusted healthcare system, the trust was high. This is not the equivalent to downloading it from the app store and doing this on your own. And I feel like a lot of our field doesn't recognize the difference. Um, the next thing that I s have seen with this is they knew it was a research study. And why that mattered was the breast cancer community has a, a real high altruism uh, giving back to the community. So we have great numbers on our patient reported outcomes, but we interviewed them about why they were filling out the survey. They were doing it because it was research and it would benefit other people. Okay, again, that's not something that you can trust on for a generic deployment of these systems. Now, it works for us, and then we were able to set up that virtuous cycle, and they filled out the survey, and they got benefits from it, and then the cycle got started, but I worry about that initial cycle came from that response. Um, also, I've talked to a number of folks about have we moved into other cancer uh, areas. Um, we have not yet. We had one really, really failed attempt. So we were working in the same North Georgia regional area, and so we started working on stomach cancer, uh, just because that was... It, only because it made sense of the adjacency of the folks we were working at. Stomach cancer is, is uh, highly correlated with alcoholism um, and other uh, uh, behavioral uh, associated diseases. Um, so 100% complete failure um, in terms of being able to engage that population, including some of our patients selling the tablets uh, for, for booze money. Um, so really understanding that this design worked well for that context, but this is not a silver bullet in terms of understanding how we're going to improve patient engagement around cancer care as a whole. So where do I want to go with this? So um, we've been asked, and this is, seems to be the hot question in Washington and many other places, you know, what is the role of AI um, and what is the role of uh, apps? Sometimes they remember to say HCI, but they don't always. Um, but what is kind of, you know, what can we do within this space and what kind of the challenges that we want to work with? 
So what have I learned over the years? Um, so the aging in place problem, I still run into this question in almost every project I work in. Can we answer the question, what was today a normal day? Um, I'm now working with adults diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, working with their care partners, working there with their health team. I'm still getting, you know, basically the question is, was today a normal day is a variant of is there a decline or not a decline? This is really difficult for anybody who's honest about sensing work. Mondays are different than Tuesdays, Saturdays are different than Sundays, the fall is different than the summer, and folks in San Diego think this weather is cold. Um, understanding how to answer this in a reliable way is a challenge, and so our, our way of doing this was to embed this into existing social relationship. That requires either a set of grand, cap grand affordances within the design or configurability. Um, like some of our folks were like, if my dad goes and picks up the mail every day, walks to the end of the drive, gets the mail and comes back, I know that's a normal day. Well, okay, well we know how to hack a sensor that does that. If my grandmother uh, watches her favorite soap opera, I know she's had a normal day. Well, that's a different sensor. Um, I don't know if you remember when the internet teapot came out. This was a Japanese invention. Everybody emailed me this article. It basically was the same caregiver thing, but it lets you know when an aging parent was having tea because that is such a ritual and custom within Japan. That was enough information. These are all one-offs, so do you see the problem, right? How do we actually embed this? Because a lot of folks have this question and want to be able to accomplish these goals. All right, second, um, our diabetes, it turned out that this notion of teaching people to be a detective and empowering that kind of local sense making was critically important. It changed, our diabetes educator said it was kind of night and day difference uh, in her working with the people that were coming to her as newly diagnosed diabetics. How do we create that type of personalized goal setting to decision making within that context? I'm still mad at the NIH for taking the human out of the loop. I think we can develop scalable approaches to this where human beings stay in that context because those relationships matter. But in the meantime, we need to have the ability for people, as we were talking about with gut instinct, to be able to set up those experiments. You know, can I still have orange juice? What kind of nightly snack works? Uh, what can I order at my favorite Chinese restaurant uh, when I go out with my friends? These are the kinds of questions our folks were asking. Um, around our pediatric uh, uh, fitness work, this is about identity presentation. It's not a big surprise for anybody who works with adolescents, right, that in terms of kind of shaping and understanding their approach to health and fitness, this is about who they are and how that is socially reinforced amongst their friends. Um, privacy is incredibly important within that and designing within that social context. If you're designing something that is aimed at school age kids, partner with schools. Figure out how to do that. That is the context where you're going to be able to drive things home. Too much of our work, and I've looked at with this with some amazing researchers like Tiffany Veno, around healthcare disparities have gone for this individual quantit quantitative self type of approach. And we know from the literature that that works with a highly educated, highly uh, empowered group of folks. I'd like to reach everyone else. If we're gonna reach everyone else, we have to do it within a social context, not just creating heroes of individual action. Um, within this work, um, trying to figure out, what did I say? <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, lots of questions around um, uh, data collection. You know, we know that we can sense and get this kind of data, but having, creating people in partnership with doing that and be able to get kind of the valid ground truth um, efforts we need. We need human driven machine learning. I, the goals that I'm hearing from all of my physicians is with this kid I want to focus on, on this data because I think this is what makes a difference and with this kid it's different and with this kid it's different. It is not a one size fits all population data type of machine. You're going to have spotty data. That's the reality. Get over it. Figure out something that's going to let, let you work within that context. Um, and then I am really, really sold on these personalized healthcare coaches. We're now trying to repeat that in, in a number of different contexts. Um, what I want is this hyper-personalization, which is my shorthand for these comorbidities and bringing in that knowledge. We may not know the answer, that's okay, but if we can surface the question and my breast cancer patients can take that question to the right folks to get the answers, that's all right, right? The system doesn't have to be able to answer everything, 
but it be, has to be able to recognize where the need is and expose that going forward. This is my name for, um, so if some of you are familiar with phenotyping of working machine learning of, of uh, building up data. Most people are doing this off of EHR data, very medical data. I want to do this off of socioeconomic data because if I'm going to mat match my cancer patients to other survivors or really understand what they're going through, I need to know that they've got two kids at home and they're worried about gas money or I need to know that they go to the Lutheran church um, and uh, um, you know, this particular social context is really important to them. If I'm going to connect them with resources that they trust that will move the needle on their behavior, that's the kind of information that will make a difference. I've yet to be able to convince the NSF that this matters, but I'm going to keep trying. All right, um, apologies for the image, but I have a cautionary tale in this. Um, when I was doing this work, um, again, Mark Weiser, Xerox Park, UbiComp, we make the world a better place because of these technologies. Um, I was working with kids pretty close when we were doing that fitness work with the pedometers. Um, and we were working with kids and we were doing some internet survey stuff, like how much do you use the internet and how do you use it um, and what do you use it for? And the girls were cracking up with each other, saying, yeah, yeah, I use it for diet tips. And the woman's like, yeah, right, diet tips. We're like, what? So we started talking to them a little bit, pulled them out of the focus group. And uh, folks are like, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, she, you know, whatever the slang term was at the time was about, yeah, no, she's not looking up diet tips. She's, you know, she's, you know, using, you know, getting tips about how to be anorexic. Um, hidden in plain sight is a hell of a lot of data on the internet about how people are using uh, our environments that we have built to reinforce and further exacerbate mental health disorders. So A, why does this matter? Well, we kind of built, we the HCI community, we've created these environments and we're not noticing what's happening within that space, but B, are we making things worse? So this has been a research uh, program by Jessica Pater looking at what we started with a 3C strategy. Could we understand the media content on online platforms and its associated uh, associations with digital self-harm? Can we understand the relationship between those two clinical treatment? Um, and by the way, along the way, we also discovered a lot of gender biases uh, within that clinical treatment and its relationship uh, to online content. And then can we understand the relationship? Can we get closer to causation? So some of the things that we are finding that worry me. Um, so the first and foremost, and this isn't a surprise once I say it, is that what we're getting from interviews with these, with these girls at this time is who we're working with, is that um, it goes along the lines like this. Uh, I was looking for something for how to lose weight. I went into kind of this form, generic word, and you know, discovered these, you know, this content and these people, and you know, they were doing things way worse than I was doing. So you know, it must have been okay. It must have been normal because you know, when you start looking for it, it's everywhere. And so what we were seeing, and by looking at this through the lens with cultivation theory, was a normalization of who they were in comparison. So remember my kids with the fitness and where they were compared to everyone else? Same phenomena, but driving people to uh, destructive behaviors and driving them to it quickly. The other thing that we've seen, and this goes back to our, again, my fitness tracker work and the things that we've looked at, is the quantification of that and the tools that are allowing the quantification of that is really terrifying. And I've also now seen this in my diabetic patients in a different way. So we're creating beautiful tools that expose numbers because our field loves numbers and we love to track things and people are taking those and damaging their bodies. What the work that Jessica is going to present at CSCW next week um, was uh, the relationship of these folks were kind of within this content and then they started to quickly track like for this calorie I need to over I need to exercise more for this I need to do this they got in very very tight quantitative loops that drove their behavior and they the all of the interviews it was like putting you know you know going putting gasoline on the fire big inflection point in their behavior because of this uh, confounding of these tools. What we see in my, uh, our diabetes patients is kind of the other thing. So remember we took that human out of the loop in the NIH study? Um, is an over quantification of blood sugar levels. We're making it easier for people to track their sugar levels. So what are they doing? 
they're abusing their insulin to make the numbers match. So they're doing long-term destruction to their body as opposed to doing the things that we want them to do because we're overly fixating them on the wrong piece of information. Poor design is leading to really, really destructive behaviors. So, you know, within this space and the kinds of things that we need to do, you know, we need to understand the downsides of these types of environments and understand how we can expose cultivate, cultivation, understand how we're exposing norms. We're looking at this in other questions, like how do you see bias in data? Well, people are essentially biasing their own engagement with the data. How do you pull them up and out of that? You know, this looks normal, but that's only because the spotlight is here, not everywhere else. Our human brains are not evolving fast enough for these types of experiences. There's things that we can do from the design side that no one else is going to do to help change that equation. So for me, uh, you know, the question is now this human-centered approach to AI and health. Um, I think there's a, a huge number of questions that we can ask within that, but in my mind, it is leading first and foremost with the user experience design and figuring out kind of the right amount and right types of AI to lead to these questions. And I don't think there's that many places like UCSD and Georgia Tech that are asking it in this way. And I think that framing matters a great deal to the success that we can have in our field. Um, I will close by saying there's also ways that we articulate this to the rest of the world. So I've worked with the CCC a lot on different types of white papers for visioning. Uh, we've done this around aging, and we recently have done this around disparities. So these are resources available to the community. And anytime you get a request to participate in this kind of white paper process, remember that a whole bunch of people read these, both in terms of what to fund and what matters for the agenda for our country, and that's worth doing. Thank you very much. I ran a little long, but I'm still before five. Thank you. Thank you.